Hi and welcome back to the workshop. In this chapter we're going to start mapping this out, so first we need to talk a couple of concepts about the archings. If while it's true that some makers like myself use different archings according to the characteristics of the wood they ha we have and the desirable result, most makers use more standard concepts. So I will talk more about these ones instead, as I think that they're key to, to begin with and to understand uh, how to work and it doesn't really make sense to start playing around with the archings until the first standard concepts are not more reassured and perfected. For example, for this violin, I will make a maximum height of the arching. Uh, well, I can't remember right now, but I have it written down. But it's, it's around 16.5 mm for the top and a maximum height of the arching of um, 16.5 mm as well for the back. The usual Cremony standard though it's, uh, it's a maximum height of the arching for the top of 15.8 mm or 15.5 mm and for the back it's a maximum height of the arching of 14.8 or 14.5 mm. There's always this um, 10 mm difference between the top and the back which is the lower one. As all my archings will change according to the characteristics of the wood that I have and the result that I want to achieve then I can't really use something like templates to, work, to guide myself as I will work mainly just by looking at it and touching the archings and then readjusting from there. Nevertheless, you will find in the documents attached the necessary material to make the templates for the archings and the procedure to make it is to make them is exactly the same as the one we used before. So printing them, gluing, it, gluing them to a piece of formica or something like that then cutting them with a fret saw and finishing them with, um, with the files. Another important thing to mention is this. The arching that goes through the whole length of the instrument is called the sixth. Then the other ones, the ones let's say that belong to the width of the instrument, they're called the fifth. Being this one the first, so basically the maximum width of the upper bout. The second is this one. So on the, on the um, shortest distance between the, where the corners begin, let's say. The third is the shortest point between the C bouts. The fourth is the same as well with the corners on the minimum distance between the corners, where the corners begin, the curve begins. And the fifth is this one. So basically the uh, widest point the, between the in that corresponds to the lower bout. I would say that some of the key things to start working on archings are this. First of all, if possible, comparing and looking at other archings from older instruments so that the mind and the, the eyes get used to, to the idea, to the shape of an arching. And the second one, and probably the most important one, is to accept that there will be mistakes it's almost impossible not to make a mistake when making the first archings. So here I have to show you some finished archings and the pieces of wood with the ones we're going to start working now. As you can see, in the middle there's not really that much of a difference of the height, but there's a, an immense considerable difference here by the edges. I'm going to put them like this, for example this is the top. So the difference is as huge and as you can see the line here for the border always needs to be respected and it's this one here. Same for the back. Now just because the differences are huge it doesn't mean that one needs to be working very quickly at the beginning uh, because if not there will be mistakes immediately. What I usually like doing is to consider that um, on the back around 3 millimeters will be relatively flat, let's say. I'm not, I can't say exactly flat, but relatively flat. So I'm going to be tracing a line of 3 millimeters here.
Here it's, it's not 3 millimeters, here it's less. On the seabouts, I mean. And for the top, I usually make around 25 millimeters instead. Now I'm being really, really imprecise because I still know that I can rough everything out. But this to give an idea could work. Then from the center line on the top, I'm going to trace around 42 millimeters to each side. So 21, sorry, 42 in total, 21 to each side from the center line. Again, I'm not being super precise here because I still need to lower this a lot. So if you can see here on the arching, always this area is higher. What belongs, let's say, to the sixth. So I'm, and, and this area in particular, here's where the bridge will come. So it can be really super curved if not the bridge wouldn't fit. This is a tiny bit flatter. Uh, it's not really flat. It's important that it's not flat, if not curved, but it's flatter than the rest. So that's why I'm tracing this 21 and 21, so 42, because the distance usually for the between the legs of the bridge is 42 millimeters as well, which is the same as the distance between the eyes. Depending on the model of the instrument, but for this one in particular, it's 42. For the back instead, if the back is, is a bit more, has more of a curve. So I'm going to be tracing 15 to each side. Another reason why I'm doing this, or, or let's say the main reason why I'm doing this at this point as well, is because if, if this, this ones are still very high, but if I was closer to the final height, then I know that if I do something with the gouge in this area, I might mess everything up. It might be too low. So this, this ones can be the most dangerous areas. This is a very dangerous area while working as well. This one's here. They're very, very dangerous. These ones may be the easiest ones because it's the flattest part, 